a man whose unique view of life has greatly influenced modern art. It all depends on how inspired you. Oh, I try to do big, simple, uh, simple designs. The more I look at it, the more I like it. I don't set out to be controversial. What's happening, gang? This is Richard Arthur. This is I See What You're Saying, and today I'm lucky enough to sit with Neon Pioneer and living legend Lily Lockett <laughs> at her studio. In, That's very sweet. You're very sweet to allow me to enter the, the sanctuary of neon light. It really is not something I can capture on the laptop, but it's like a temple of neon, really. So first of all, where can people find your work outside of the studio? I have some big public art commissions in Los Angeles and in Van Nuys. I have a big one, 114 feet long at the Van Nuys Flyaway. Is that a mall? No, it's the bus station that takes people to LAX. Uh, flyaway. The Flyaway bus LAX station. LAX Flyaway. Yeah, right. I always try to blag the fee and I always try to get on there for free uh, and they always catch me, uh, which rightly they should. You should be able to pay the dollar to get to LAX if yeah, you're spending yeah. 2500 to go to Thailand or whatever it is. <laughs> then I have another one that's on Olive Street, L.A. Angel, that's a 75 foot long piece. How have I missed that? I think L.A. is too big to see everything is why. So I really have to go seek that out and check that out. Where are you from in the world? Well, I grew up in the Army, so we lived lots of places. We moved every two or three years and started out in Washington, D.C., but didn't live there. And then we were in Monterey, California, and then Kansas, New York, and then Germany, Maryland, back to L.A. Did you ever do, like, Japan or Hawaii? Well, I've been there. I've had, I've had three exhibitions in Japan. Oh, my God. My pieces involve neon, and I went all the way to London to find a fella called Rob Court, who uh -huh. was inspired by your work and he talked about it at length in his press and he has a little bit of press for doing what he's doing having gone from a sign maker into what is now cheeky phrases uh -huh. you know cuss words and then taking inspiration from what we see behind us bending the glass tubes into figurative form right another person that he looked at was called Stephen Antonakos uh, yeah yeah did you know Stephen I didn't know him I think he's dead now right so much so I know nothing about the history really he was New York based okay neon artist was he a contemporary or was he yeah contemporary okay. yeah so I was in the Stedelijk Museum this is like a little bit all over the place but I'll probably edit oh shit I'm not even on the camera is that better yeah okay I was in the Stedelijk Museum there's the rooms that I really am drawn to Mm -hmm. And then there's the rooms that, you know, I don't really commit to memory. And the rooms that I really committed to my aesthetical soul, if you like, were minimalist rooms. So a Donald Judd mm -hmm. and that kind of aesthetic. Mm -hmm. What could be construed as maybe the nothing artists? Yeah. And by nothing, the, I mean in the best possible way. Well, I think they're called minimal, minimalist. Mm -hmm. it's, interestingly, Donald Judd hated the term minimalist really because it was I think foisted upon him by museum curators yeah which I know there's a history with you and museum problems which we can or cannot get into <laughs> I know nothing of it I just get the letters online oh yeah and I'm all about yeah fuck them but I don't know anything of the history <laughs> other than feel free to get into that or not but I was in the Stedelijk and in one of the rooms there was a painting from 1930 something it was like a minimalist kind of muddy painting mm -hmm. maybe action art and then, uh, for no apparent reason, it had just a strip of green neon hmm. installed into it. And it was 1930-something. Who made it? Do you, do you remember? It would be a lot more professional sounding if I did remember. And I thought about it while driving down here, and I was uh -huh. like, shit, I don't have the good Wi-Fi on the phone. I can't Google it. I should know who that is. Yeah, I want to say it was a Dutch or French name. Really? Hmm. And it was a strip of green neon, but it had nothing to do with the figure. Yeah. Would you say that you were a pioneer in bending glass tube? I don't bend glass. I've never bent a neon tube. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, I'm an artist designer of my works. I do all the uh, fabrication. I do cutting metal and making patterns and wiring yeah, yeah. and doing everything. But I, I draw patterns and give them to a professional tube vendor. That's what I do as well. My lips never touch argon right. uh, right. because I'm also kind of afraid of that element. I couldn't do what I do without the brave souls who want to burn it. Well, I started really complicated pieces. For instance, the piece behind me, Blessed Oblivion, I made in 1975. I would have had to practice tube bending for at least 15 years to be able to bend those tubes, you know? Luckily, at the time, I had a tube bender that had 30 years experience bending tubes who bent the tubes for me. I haven't bent tubes myself. Okay, right on. Neither have I, but I consider myself a neon artist. Yeah, sure. I'll show you the work after we're done filming. But, sure. um, well, you know, people don't realize that photographers don't make their own cameras, lenses, paper, yeah. film, whatever. Thorpe wasn't the Leica Corporation. Right, and <laughs> architects don't build their own buildings. Right on. Right, you yeah. know, but somehow, you know, there's become this kind of uh, idea that neon artists have to bend their own glass. Oh, really? Do you, yeah. do you ever get anyone who's had some kind of chagrin at the fact that you do not do that? Well, there's a whole little group of these women shibens. You've heard of the shibens group? No. No? I'll okay. put a link if you well, would like or not. If, depending <laughs> or not. On, yeah, okay. <laughs> depending on the history. Yeah, I mean, uh, and they're adamant about bending their own glass. Okay. You know, you know that's fine. If, they want to do that. I just chose not to. Okay. I'm looking at the Blessed Oblivion piece, which is a stunning achievement. My neon pieces are only ever about five foot high because that's what fits in my car. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that's the that's sort of the budgetary process right now. Yeah. If my car was bigger, the pieces would be larger. I'll bet the most complex part to bend was that table bend where that leg goes up and around. You see that? Mm, yeah, that right. Really acute cut. Yeah, but actually not. You know, the, the really the more difficult tubes are the snake and the little doodads inside the snake. Oh, to get them all to sort of adhere to the graphical yeah. composition? Yeah. So when you talk about fabricating and things... Like I saw out the metal. Yeah, rad. With the saber saw. So interestingly, on that score of uh, outsourcing, you have like this mastermind group of people that you are the generator of the ideas without yes. you that they could not exist. That's right. They would not exist. Well, they have other people. They work for other people. Yeah. You know. My guy is a signage man. Who, right. He is happy to have me pay him. Right. And he he understands that I'm doing art. He will also do like a Chuck E. Cheese of uh, course. plastic yeah. LED. By the way, how anti-LED is Lily Lockage? Well, I do use some LEDs for background lighting. Do you? Yeah. Well, yeah. begrudgingly? Like in the uh, in that lens, there's some LEDs. What, that's like a ship part or something? It's actually a stove. It's a stove with a Fresnel lens. The other one with the head over there, the red, yellow, blue, those are LEDs in the, in the head. I don't like to look at LEDs, but I, I mean, I do use them sometimes for backlighting. The problem with LEDs is they don't have a very long lifespan. That's something that the LED industry doesn't talk about mm. but the maximum lifespan of an LED is seven years whereas yeah. neon can last 70 years or more you know and then when the LEDs fail you can't just fix them or replace one part you have to start all over from scratch they're not fixable they're also not green and neon is green oh wow by virtue of the fact that it is long-lasting Aren't some of the minerals rare and thus rare earth pink or something is a finite mineral that's almost like a concern maybe i don't i don't think there's enough neon rob court and slap me if you would like to but rob court has described it as a dying art form insofar as being replaced by your tackier inexpensive led and things which i by the way was told by rob in london that led creates pinstripes in the waveform. I don't know how to properly say this, yeah. but the way that the light splashes across the wall is not a true halo. Unless you filter it through some kind of material, as in the case of the lens there, uh -huh. it's not going to do what neon does, which is this complete glow. Uh, the apparent halo, halo. glow. Yeah, yeah. Which splashes across. That's right. my favorite thing about neon is that this piece is, you know, 11 feet tall yeah. or whatever it is, and but it's really a thousand feet square foot because it splashes across an entire exhibition right space, it draws you in which is my hack because my pieces are five foot but they're really 23 feet whatever mm -hmm. the splash is mm -hmm. an ambient light right neon's my favorite i love it yeah i didn't know if it was comfortable 
for you to talk about because I know nothing about it and you feel free to say yay or nay. But you were one of the founders of the Museum yes. of Neon Art. Yes. Acronym MONA. Yes. And it was started here in my studio right in 1981. Here. I founded it with Richard Jenkins, and we started having exhibitions here in my studio in May of 1982. And it was here for 12 years, the first 12 years of its life. Not Richard Jenkins, the actor. No, no, okay. no, no. Obviously. <laughs> so now, if you're in sort of Galleria area Glendale, right. so very commercial, nothing to do with high-mindedness or creativity, really, because it's sort of a commercial center, that is now the location of the museum. Right. I find it to be, without knowing the history, some place that I don't feel comfortable visiting in terms of the entire area of town. Okay. Because unless I'm looking to buy a pair of Nikes or something. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, to the museum's credit, it's, it's 40 years old started in 81, oh, okay. so it's now 2021, 20, so it's lasted 40 years, which is remarkable for grassroots kind of organization. Right on. What's kind of ironic is that the city of Glendale was responsible for businesses having to remove their neon signs from the exteriors of their buildings in the early 80s. They had an ordinance that said neon was blighted and all these businesses had to take them down, including some that were then donated to the Museum of Neon Art, Zinke Shoe Repair, and La Fonda, which is the Flamenco Dancers, beautiful piece. Does it move? No, actually it doesn't move. Okay. But the Zinke Shoe Repair sign was made in 1928, and the owner of the property told us that the business paid $3,500 for this sign when a Buick cost $850 <laughs> in 1928. That's how much people valued having a neon sign at that time. The La Fonda sign, the owner was crying when the sign came down. So now the city of Glendale is kind of sponsoring the Museum of Neon Art but they were responsible for all of this neon having to be taken down from businesses against the business's will. What is the nature of the, quote, blighting of the neon? Well, a blighted neighborhood is one that is run down. And so neon was associated with liquor stores and porno oh, parlors okay. and all so of that. In and film so noir, when the, they're driving through the getaway scene and it's the montage of film right. splicing, it's always neon signs. <laughs> In the, in the 40s, it's like, we gotta get out of here. And then they drive through like ne'er do well alley right. on their way with the, they got the loot in the car right. and the yeah. damsels in the car and whatever. And there's always neon and it's always like a martini glass and yeah. a, a leg so, kicking burlesque dancer. Oh wow, so what year did that sort of a city ordinance that- in the uh, Well, it became an ordinance in the 70s and then it was written into the law God. of the city, in, including, including San Diego. What? You know, you say you're from San Diego. Yeah. Well, San Diego had the same ordinance. It was like a 10 year period that businesses had to get rid of their neon and then in the early 80s, boom, they had to remove it. And in San Diego, there was a group called Sonos, Save Our Neon organization, a group of four people that started saving signs and they rented forklifts and trucks and they took down all these major, major signs in San Diego and stored them. And then, <laughs> you know, things turn around and John Jarity built Horton Plaza and started incorporating neon into Horton Plaza and then neon came back in San Diego. And the fellow's name was? John Jarity. John Jarity. So Architect. Do you think that his incorporating of Neon had to do with a throwback admiration? Or, you know, because I wonder what replaced Neon during that era, because I wasn't around at that time. I yeah. don't know. And I'd never... You'd never heard, heard of that? I'd never heard of this. Yeah. Because San Diego had a tremendous amount of Neon. It was a sailor's town, you know, so there were like oh. the big dragon for bars and, you know, they had the campus drive-in with this drum majorette on the exterior of the drive-in theater, this beautiful drum majorette and like I said Save Our Neon organization saved all those signs Save our and, neon. and they got them for free and then when Neon came back in San Diego they started selling these things back to some of the businesses as kind of just decoration you know, they would put, I don't know I don't know what depending on who the shareholder is yeah, or I whatever don't know. I don't know do you know what replaced Neon during the time that signage was sort of well like you, you've seen these fluorescent boxes the re rectangular boxes with words and lit by fluorescent tubes. Blow through, frosted right. Right. polymer or whatever. Yeah, it's just white plex and then it was lit with long fluorescent tubes. Those uh -huh. came into style, ugly as they are. They're as Dan Flavin as they uh, are. <laughs> and then there were the channel letters, the channel letter signs. 
you know. They, channel letters. Yeah, they were big. They were lit with neon. They were You didn't see the neon, but the channel letters had neon in them that... So neon had to hide like it had to hide. Frank from the conservative right. government at the time. Right. That's really interesting. Speaking of which, I really rather appreciate your human rights element to some of the pieces. So in the early days, doing self-portraits, incorporating your own nudity in some of them, are yeah. there? Right. Well, yes. It's tough to say because these words were hurled at me as a death threat in middle school. Fag, homo, yeah. die. That particular piece, which reminds me of a Nam Jun Paik piece, uh -huh. which is the Buddha watching TV uh -huh. thing that you can see in the Tate Modern. It's, it's really thrilling the, how do I say it, the, the standing up for yourself, really, through the work, and also to besmirch the former president, Donald Trump, yeah. with your Pinocchio piece. Right. Because it's so clear that not only is the system often lying, but someone that was so overtly lying as a matter of day-to-day -day operating protocol. Oh, yeah. 27,000 lies, I think they've tracked. Did you ever get any flack online, such as your presence is online? people who were maybe pro-Trump that saw that Pinocchio piece, which is a piece, it's in the other room right here, and it's actually probably illuminating part of the scene. It's a piece that Lily did of Donald Trump where when you turn it on, the nose grows. And then a cherry pops, pops on a it. A cherry pops up at the end, which I will include images <laughs> for the viewers. Uh, <laughs> actually, I've never gotten any flack for making that piece. However, I did get death threats for cutting up my Volvo piece. What? Uh, for this sculpture, I had a 1973 Volvo 1800 ES, and I drove it for, I don't know, six or eight years, and then the fuel injection system failed, and I couldn't get it fixed because it had one of the first computerized fuel injection systems. And so it sat in front of my house for about 15 years, getting more and more decrepit. <laughs> and then it got sighted, it had to be off the street in 72 hours. And so I thought, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do now? And so I went out to dinner with a friend of mine who's an industrial designer, and he said, ah, just cut a wedge out of it and wrap it around the corner of a wall. So we did that. We had it towed to a wrecking yard who actually took out all the engine and all the guts, and we cut it. and wrapped it around a wall and made the sculpture because okay. now it's art and you can't yeah. cite it yeah Is well no, right? no no it was in my studio we brought it into my studio oh, okay. at that point yeah i thought imagine if you stuck it on the side of your house and no, you said, look no, guys no, no, i'm no. doing neighborhood art and no, you can't no, come no, after me no. wow wouldn't that be something we exhibited it at the la auto show in 2005 and th death th threat well not not at the auto show but in 2000 and I think 2018 we exhibited it at the Peterson Automotive okay. Museum and it was being sold at an auction and Hemings Motor News did a little story on it you know the car magazine car, car guy car guy yeah whatever yeah. that is yeah and <laughs> at that point I got some death threats for cutting up this classic car from the shareholders of Volvo or I mean no, nut no, cases. no, no, no just, you know just what just nut cases I think what we learn in the world especially as creatives is that there's a lot of people that just are not available to the possibility of altering reality in the aid of making things more interesting or beautiful. Yeah. There are people who are simply not wired for that. Yeah. As yeah, I say that, I realize true. I love that all of the works are wired. Ooh, the Tesla piece. See, this place has my, I just get distracted by everything and I want to, I want to live inside of the halo glow of all these pieces. Oh, there's the piece. Yeah. Okay. And do you see yourself on camera in that piece? Is that what it yes, is? Yes, you can. Yeah, you stand in my shoes on the floor and then you see your face in the monitor. Did that ever exhibit somewhere? Oh uh, yeah, it's been exhibited uh, different places. Yeah. Somewhere outside of the context of maybe a safe space like a museum or something like that would be well, really it was at Cal. It was something. exhibited at a big show at Cal State Northridge, a re like a retrospective, and you know people would step mm -hmm. in my shoes and see their face, and and then one time you know this big football player kind of guy you know did that saw his face and then quickly jumped out. Ah, uh, that's Quick, telling. Quickly jumped could, out. For the yeah, viewers, yeah. could you tell us what we're talking about since we can't see it on the camera? Well, so, you're gonna have to splice it. In, I right? will, yeah. I will, yeah. Yeah, but it's called Sticks and Stones, and it has a, a litany of homophobic uh, slur words. Gay, fag, bull dyke. Gay, <laughs> gay, fag, dyke, fruit, fairy, lesbo, homo, queer, lesi, nelly, pansy, faggot, fag, hag, pervert, muff, diver, diesel, dyke, which I'd never have heard, bull dagger, which is a new one, cocksucker, I called my dad that once, uh, <laughs> Bull dyke, which used to be a term of endearment among lesbians, and now it's now I don't know if lesbian exists anymore. Everyone is non-binary now. But I remember when we called them lesbians. Yeah. And everyone's like, you just sound old. And I'm like, I guess I am old. Maybe I'll edit this part out. I probably won't. <laughs>
it seems like just to be homosexual now is very old hat. And so it's difficult for me to sometimes the new pronouns and things. Yeah. I don't want to be the old dinosaur because... I was the non-binary. I was the trans. Society cast me aside in the way that yeah. I, I now don't understand the non-binary or pronoun concerns. So I want to not walk through life with everything painted in the context that makes sense for my comfort level. Mm -hmm. Which is why I think the piece to the reverse of me is really important. <laughs> and it's funny that a football player sees his face and then darts really quickly because there's gay football players that they could never be out until last year, if that. So I wanted to ask you, in your journey of creating, have you ever made something you just can't stand and you hate it? Something that wasn't a success in terms of you had a notion to produce something, you put it together, and these are physical works that take a lot of dedication and time yeah and you sort of have to see them before they exist I probably have done something like that yeah I, but mostly not because I spend a lot of time doing preparatory drawings beforehand and Pretty and cool. really living with the idea before actually making it the materials are so expensive that I have to be sure that the idea is good speak the blessed word of yeah. materials because, yeah yeah my work is very there's no abstraction or chance it's very, yeah it's very very deliberate. Have yeah. You, I don't know if I've yeah. you've seen my work. I don't think I have. It, you may like it. It's a fusion of fine art painting, sculptural elements, neon, mm -hmm. floated off the wall. Is there narrative? Yes, because it's a face that's relatively iconic, like Marcel Duchamp mm -hmm. or Klaus Nomi, mm -hmm. which is my favorite panel, shaped like Klaus Nomi. Mm -hmm. you know? I like Klaus Nomi. Oh, man. And I did two colors of neon just to see what would happen. I did red uh -huh. and I did white. So the, the neon is shaped in the silhouette panel cut of Klaus Nomi, which I'll show you when we wrap. But I wound up doing the white neon. felt more odd and it felt new. Where mm -hmm. red in that particular piece was too obvious or something. Mm -hmm. So in your journey of creating, you create blueprints that live in your head for long enough that if they continue to glow, you won't cast them aside. I have pieces that I did the drawing and then did the piece eight years later. Oh, wow. You know, that long. Okay. Where the, yeah. where the idea was germinating for eight years till I decided it was worth doing. Yeah. Wow. Because, so, like I said, it's the materials are so costly that you can't really afford to make mistakes. Things live in a roster, in other words, and it rotates as they, yeah, as they talk kind of. or something. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe things are on that roster and were designed and they had never become right. manifested into right. reality or the physical counterpart right. of your idea. Have you ever made a mistake or an accident in the studio that oh, yeah. drove a new direction? Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. Can you recall any of those? Oh gosh. You must have had a thousand of those. With neon? <laughs> How many things have you broken? We'll talk about that next. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I broke the tail on this panther. Oh my god. One yeah. time when I was putting it together at a gallery when I had probably had a glass of wine beforehand. <laughs> uh, I find that I really can't drink and work with neon. I found that I can't really drink and do much of anything. <laughs> But I do, and I realize, oh wow, if I try to record music and stuff, which is another mm -hmm. little fun thing I do, there's no chance of hitting that note drunk. Yeah. Just can't do it. Yeah. If it sounds and feels like I can, I have curiously found that I am able to wire neon a little drunk, Yeah. but not drunk, you know? <laughs> so without being able to recall a particular mistake, let me then ask you, how many things have you purposefully broken, enraged, no, none. No? None. Never? I no. You never just no. smashed no. a bulb? Never. Because of the cost of materials? Never. I just, I just don't do that. Okay. <laughs> Very good. I have only ever broken one piece of neon on accident. Yeah. It wasn't purposeful. It was a mistake piece that my neon dude for the Klaus Nomi, he had made it in pink. Instead would, of the color you wanted. Yeah, which is white and red. The last question I have is for young artists who are looking at Lily Lockich and they're saying, wow, how is she doing it and how can I do my thing? So advice for young artists. Well, my advice for anybody actually is that you need to have three professions in your life that you can jump from one to another because when the economy changes, you have to be able to be resilient enough to give up what you're doing and jump into something else. I mean, who would have thought that the music industry would collapse like it did, you know, and Kate Bush would have to go on tour to make money after 35 years of being able just to sell CDs. But she didn't get on a plane, I can tell you that. <laughs> 
right? I don't know. She's I, deathly afraid of yeah, flight. Yeah, all these musicians now, they can't make money from recordings. They have to tour. They have to make Merch. money from selling t-shirts, stuff like that, rather than the actual CDs. So I started in advertising. I was working for a company doing movie posters, designing movie oh, wow. posters as an art director. And I was paid well, and that was what I was able to buy materials, my neon materials. So I was always doing neon. Parlaying from your source of income. Yeah, right, the, right. Which is what I do. If I right. make money from selling small commissions right. of strangers' children, I go right to my wood guy, and I des designate this for my... Right now, I'm doing a Jean-Michel Basquiat head, mm -hmm. cut out in silhouettes with the freeform dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. The neon is going to be the most complex we've ever made in terms of, mm -hmm. I mean, I say that and it's like, snooze fest, what I'm doing because this is so complex behind us. For the purposes of the podcast, can we go stand just to show the scale? Okay. This is me and Lily Lockich in front of Blessed Oblivion, which is a massive, I guess, California rattler, I don't know, the genus of the snake, fighting a black panther, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an exquisite Corning glass. Which is the blue glass? Well, Corning glass is all the glass. Actually, Corning made all this glass at one time. Corning? Yeah. Like Corning, Dow Corning? Corning Glass Company. Yeah, they don't yeah. make neon anymore, but at this time they made ruby red, nobile gold, and the cobalt. How many colors in the studio are no longer possible to produce? There must I, be a few. Yeah, I don't know, but yes. Yeah. I was in London, and I had rare earth neon. On my first piece uh -huh. and I was at a house of a friend who was on speed and showing me how to do kung fu uh -huh. and my neon is in the back uh -huh. and I was going to store models to show it to Kate Moss's people to, in hopes of having a show with her uh, the next day uh -huh. the next week he's on speed he's doing karate he snaps my neon yeah it happened to be the only color I could not get in London. Yeah. So I had to call a Minnesota producer and have them ship it ship it out ASAP and it was just like a 27 inch straight piece of rare yeah. earth pink which is like a really bubblegum strawberry-ish uh -huh. pink because all Rob Court had and all of London had was what was more of a Cadillac pink uh -huh. and a dusty. So that was a nightmare and that was the only other time I had a neon piece broken and it was because the guy I knew was doing karate on speed. Yeah, I had a show in Paris in 1978 where I went to Paris and built 10 neon sculptures using French craftsmen and French materials. And neon was basically developed in Paris in 1910 by Georges Claude. And I thought they would have all the colors that we had here in America and more. No, they had eight colors, eight, <laughs> and they were all pastel. <laughs> I had, I had never had a pastel thought in my life, and, and here I was in Paris with my designs, my patterns, having to translate them all into these pastel colors, when you can see, you know, these are not pastels. Right. These are very, yeah. They're loud. I wasn't yeah. aware pastel could even occur in neon. As yeah, I, yeah, as I yeah. Say that, Pink, I see, powder blue. I see that sort of peachy color coming off of your Volvo, the Volvo piece? Or I'm sorry, near the sign. Oh, there, that piece. Yeah, that's yeah. sort of like peach color. It is like a peach color, It's the only yeah. thing I would ever seen pastel. I wasn't yeah. even aware that that was on offer. Yeah, you know, there's pastel yellow, pastel pink, pastel pastel blue, pastel green, you know, they're just very light, so very light. So you really achieve a halo glow in the same way that you could with... Well, they're just, it was just different, and I was having this show, and I really needed some rich colors for my piece, and had a girlfriend at the time that actually brought over some uh, neon tubes to me that were already made. From the U.S.? From the U.S. to, to um, incorporate into my pieces in Paris. Holy shit. Was this from California yeah. to Paris? And yeah. And how did she just flew with them in yeah. bubble wrap? Yeah, yeah. I, I can tell you that to usurp the shipping cost of taking one of my Kate Moss silhouette pieces yeah. back home, bubble wrapped it, and I put it in a boogie board bag, and I prayed for the best. Yeah. And I had it in the bulkhead with me, on the plane. Uh -huh. Like, not in the luggage. I had, I think I had it on the plane with me. I might be wrong. It might have been in the, but it was on the plane. And I got back to Glassell Park where I was living, and I opened it up, sure as ever it was going to be broken. And Rob Court's sturdy, strong, I don't know the mills, somebody else does it 
but it was the thicker glass. Yeah. Completely intact. Yeah. I have it in Pasadena to this day. Yeah. It was magic. But you have to do what you have to do. So you have to sometimes take work on a plane without telling customs. Well, yeah, and you can't do it very easily since 9-11. Not anymore. Yeah. Oh, no. You no, no, can't. No. You can't be a drug smuggler anymore, America. You can't, no. So you didn't plan for pastel, but it didn't work. It wasn't going to work. I had to translate all my designs into pastels. Did any of it work, or did it change the direction? It just changed. It changed. They levitated. God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were so light that they yeah, levitated off the ground. Yeah, yeah. I bet the French must have just loved it because they didn't know any goddamn better. Yeah, right. Well, the French, the French loved my work. Yeah, they said it was comme Matisse, comme léger. Comme Matisse, comme léger. Yeah, it was and, a big compliment for the French. Okay, I must say I don't speak le français. I speak taco shop Spanish. Yeah. No, because good. that's where I learned Spanish. So I learned all the bad words first. I don't know how you say neon in Spanish. But I will say that this has been a very exciting interview, and I'm very glad and honored that you had well, me thank you. in the Sanctuary of Neon Art. Once again, where can people find your work online? It's my last name, Lakich, L-A-K-I-C-H, dot com. Awesome. So we'll link that down below. Thank you very awesome. much. Awesome. Thank you, Lily. Yeah, appreciate okay. it. Right. Yeah.